Okay, enzymes part three. So again, we left off on how the enzymes actually lower the activation energy. And remember, they use a variety of different ways to do that. Um, one being that the active site will actually orient the substrate into the correct orientation for the reaction. Um, and then as the active site will bind to the substrate, it can put stress on some of the bonds that must be broken, and then that makes it easier to reach the unstable transition state. Um, the R groups at the active site may also create a conducive environment for the specific reaction, and then the enzymes can bind covalently to the substrates in, an, in, in the intermediate step before returning to uh, the normal reaction. So from there, a cell's physical and chemical environment affects enzyme activity. So the 3D structure of an enzyme depends on its environmental conditions, and any changes in the shape can also influence the, the rate of reaction of the enzyme. And some conditions lead to the most active conformation and lead to the optimal rate of reaction. So things that influence reaction rates, one is the actual concentration of the substrate itself. As you add more substrate, that will speed up the, the rate of reaction of the enzyme, but only up to a certain point. Because at some point, then, you have all of the substrates being engaged, or I should say all of the active sites of the enzymes being engaged. And so therefore, that would be what we call enzyme saturation. Uh, the second thing that can influence the reaction rate is the enzyme concentration. The more enzymes that you have available, the more active sites you have available for substrates to bind to, so the greater the reaction rate. And the third thing that can affect reaction rate is the temperature. Temperature has a huge impact on reaction rate. As the temperature increases, the more that the substrates and enzymes um, can frequently collide. So collisions between the substrates and the active sites occur more frequently as the molecules are moving a lot faster. But along with the substrate concentration, point, um, at some point, the thermal ag agitation um, or the, the huge increase in temperature can actually begin to disrupt the weak bonds that are needed to stabilize the substrate into the active site, um, as well as stabilize the protein's, quote, active conformation. And so in that case, then the protein, if it's too, um, if the temperature is too increased or decreased, then the protein will actually denature. So therefore, each enzyme has its own optimal temperature. And another th uh, thing that, or factor that can affect the reaction rate of an enzyme is also the pH. So pH can also influence the shape of the enzyme. And so therefore, if you influence the shape of the enzyme, again, you influence the reaction rate. So each enzyme also has an optimal pH. Um, usually this falls between a pH of 6 and 8 for enzymes because, again, an enzyme is a, is a biological catalyst. So usually the pH falls between 6 and 8. However, we do have some specific enzymes, um, one being the digestive enzymes in our stomach, that are designed to work at a pH of 2 um, so that it's a very acidic environment to break down the food. Uh, and then we also have particular enzymes within the intestine that are optimal at a pH of 8. And another couple factors that can influence the reaction rate, one being the ion concentration, and specifically the concentration of ions, such as salts um, and some other ions available. What they specifically disrupt are the R groups within the active site of the protein. So again, if it's disrupting the R groups in the active site, then that has the potential of changing the conformation of the active site, which then ultimately changes the conformation of the protein, and then therefore um, the protein is, is no longer active. Another factor that can affect the reaction rate is that many enzymes, not all of them, but some of them do require a, a helper, so to speak, and it's, it's a non-protein, and it can be inorganic or, or organic. If it's an inorganic non-protein helper, we call that a cofactor. Um, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more specific about cofactors in a little bit, but basically the heme of hemoglobin would be considered a cofactor. And so they bind permanently to the enzyme or reversibly, um, but the presence of those can, can play a, a role in, in the reaction rate of the enzyme. Or again, like I said, we have organic cofactors and those are called coenzymes. And those are usually from 
derived from vitamins, so we often refer to coenzymes as vitamins, like for example, vitamin B12 or biotin. But the manners by which the cofactors assist the catalysis are very diverse depending on the cofactor and then depending on the enzyme. So again, for cofactors and coenzymes, um, like we said, proteins, they often use small non-protein molecules to perform functions that would usually be difficult without them. And the greatest example is hemoglobin, right? So in order to actually transport oxygen um, or pick up oxygen in the lungs and then transport it to other areas of the body, we need to actually pick up the oxygen. And what helps the, the protein pick up the oxygen is the cofactor, which is called heme, the heme group, okay? And it looks like this, where you have the iron atom in the middle. And that iron atom in the middle is what actually picks up the, binds to the oxygen, picks it up, and then therefore um, the protein hemoglobin can carry the oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body. So cofactors, again, are inorganic, and they're usually metal ions, okay, like iron or zinc or magnesium. Coenzymes, on the other hand, are organic, and like I said, they're derived mostly from vitamins. So here's a list of, of coenzymes, and well, a list of vitamins that end up being the, the coenzymes that work in our, in our human cells. So again, like I said, biotin, vitamin B12, folic acid, these are all really uh, common coenzymes. Okay, um, another way to increase the, the rate of reaction, or in this case, a little bit more big picture, um, we have a way of increasing the rate of metabolism in general. And in this case, I'm going to kind of refer to cell respiration a little bit. So a big factor that limits a reaction rate is the frequency with which the enzyme and the substrate collide, right? So the more you have enzyme and substrate colliding, the more the reactions can happen, okay? Um, if you don't have the enzyme and substrate colliding as much, then the less you have reactions. So we would call that diffusion limited. Um, and so, but knowing that the reaction rate depends on this, this, um, limited factor, so to speak, it begs the question of how can a cell maintain a very fast metabolic rate without having such high concentrations of substrate or high concentrations of enzymes, right? Because if the overall factor that determines the rate of reaction is the concentration of enzyme and the, and the concentration of substrate, then the question is like, well, how can the enzymes be so fast? because earlier we talked about how the turnover number is roughly 1,000 substrates per second. So how can those enzymes be so fast if there's not a high concentration of substrate or enzyme? And one of the ways, well, there's two ways actually that, that the cell can maintain these fast metabolic rates. And one of them is the idea of the multi-enzyme complex, which is extremely, extremely common. So our bodies actually have this really cool way of bringing enzymes that are involved in reaction sequences together um, uh, to form what's known as a large protein assembly, and we, and we call that a multi-enzyme complex. So in the first video, when I talked about um, one of the cool things about enzymes is that they often work in teams, this is what I meant. So in the picture below, this is showing you, I think it got cut off, but it's showing you the structure of a particular enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is going to be a very important enzyme for you to remember when we get to cell respiration. Um, so in this picture, though, it's showing you we have eight trimers of lipoamide reductase transacetylase with 12 molecules of dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase along with 24 molecules of pyruvate decarboxylase. And so this whole cons, uh, complex right here, this whole complex with the red and the green and the blue, that's what we call pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, we call that one enzyme, but it's actually made up of these three different enzymes. And so that's the multi-enzyme complex. And that particular enzyme is extremely important, like I said, for respiration. Um, it's the enzyme that converts pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, but 
When we get there, then you'll understand uh, a little bit more about it. So that's one way that we can achieve or maintain very, very fast metabolic rates is by um, bringing the different enzymes that are involved in the same reaction sequence, bringing them together to actually form one large complex. The second way, which da 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 da, we're bringing it back. Um, to maintain the fast metabolic rates is to use intracellular membranes, right? So the fact that we have uh, organelles within the cell that are membrane enclosed, um, that's helpful. And we use that to our advantage. In other words, we can, within those membranes and membrane enclosed compartments, we can actually segregate particular substrates and then particular enzymes within those compartments. And then that way that will allow the reactions to happen faster and maintain the high reaction rate. So, um, we're almost done with the factors that influence. Okay, another one is binding to inhibitors. If there are inhibitors present, that can influence the reaction rate because when you inhibit something, you prevent it from happening or you stop it from happening. So inhibitors are molecules that can actually prevent an enzyme from catalyzing the reactions. And we'll go a little bit more into that um, in the next lecture. But if the inhibitor binds to the same site as the substrate, then it will actually block the substrate from binding to it. So we call that competitive inhibition. Um, but if the inhibitor binds somewhere other than the active site um, on the, the enzyme, it will still block the substrate from binding, but it's not necessarily binding the exact active site. So we would call that non-competitive inhibition. Um, so like I said, we're going to go a little bit more in depth with that uh, a little bit later. And so in general then, as a summary, more enzyme equals a faster reaction rate. Uh, the more substrate up to a certain point, because then it becomes um, enzyme saturation, a faster reaction rate. If it's too high or too low of a temperature, then we have a slower reaction rate. If it's too high or too low of a pH, then we have a slower reaction rate, as well as the ionic concentration, which isn't on here, but ionic concentration, slower reaction rate, um, so a change in that. And then also with the presence of inhibitors, you can also have a slower reaction rate as well.